So, so, so my topic is uh, some basics of superstring theory. And the uh, reason for doing this is to uh, provide you with some of the background that you need to understand some of the subsequent lecturers. Uh, also, I think the things I'll be talking about are interesting in their own right. Many of you know much of this material already, which is good, because I'll say much too much, and if it were all new to you, you probably wouldn't be able to follow it all. Uh, so, I, a couple years ago, I co-authored a new string theory textbook with Katrin and Melanie Becker, and it's convenient and expedient uh, for me to follow the presentation that we gave there. So what I did was to assign some of the early chapters as material that you should already be familiar with, and I'll talk about some of the material in the middle chapters, and uh, some of the later chapters will be relevant to topics that will be discussed by other speakers. So what I want to do today is to discuss material that can be found in chapter six of this book, which is entitled T-Duality and D-Brains. And uh, these two topics are re related in interesting ways that we'll be de describing, so it's natural to consider them at the same time. So let me see if I can put this down over here. Okay. Is the lighting okay so that you can, if I write on the blackboard, you'll be able to read it? Well, if, if I need to write larger or if, if anything is unclear either in the writing or in the speaking, please let me know. So, so what we want to do to discuss T-duality uh, is to consider uh, a situation uh, in which we uh, take one of the dimensions, string theory has lots of dimensions, we'll take one of the dimensions to form a circle. And as a, just a, a first simplest case, we'll consider a boson, the bosonic string theory, uh, which uh, ordinarily would have a dimension 26. That's the critical dimension for the bosonic string. And we'll consider a situation in which we take uh, 25 of the dimensions to form just a 25-dimensional Minkowski spacetime and one dimension to form a circle, and we'll take that circle to have radius r. So that's the uh, standard setup for this. And so what we want to do uh, is to consider uh, the bosonic string in this situation, and we'll focus, so, so remember in the bosonic string, the degrees of freedom that one considers are the uh, coordinates x, which depend on the world sheet coordinates sigma and tau, Sigma is a parameter that labels the position along a string, conventionally taken to run from zero to pi, and tau is a time-like direction in the string world sheet. And then this, the, these functions describe the embedding of the string in the space-time. And in the simplest setup, when you go to covariant gauge and do all the standard things, uh, these coordinates satisfy just a free wave equation. Uh, so. Uh, you have a x double dot, which means tau derivatives, minus x double prime equals zero. So that's just the wave equation. So, so I want to focus on the coordinate of x that refers to the circle. And, and the, uh, so this might be where the index mu takes the value 25. Uh, that might be the circular coordinate, but I'll omit the 25 and just call it x. So the x that I'm talking about now is the one that, parameter, that, that uh, describes the circle. It's the position on the circle. And so what we want to do uh, is to uh, consider solutions of the wave equation uh, for, for, a, for, we'll start with a closed bosonic string. So it will be closed. And uh, what we want is that, uh, that this, in order that it be closed, that uh, when we uh, take the coordinate, when we increase sigma, so sigma is supposed to have periodicity pi, so when we increase sigma by uh, pi, we're supposed to get back to the same place as we started, and so that's x of sigma. But in the case of uh, where the target is a circle, 
uh, this, this can di the, the value of this can differ by a multiple of the circumference. Uh, so, so plus 2 pi r w. So, d so, that, so, the, so the formal expression it represents the same point, be, but uh, it's a multivalued coordinate. And so w is the number of times that the string winds around the circle. So w is the winding number. It's an integer. So, and it also has a sign. So, uh, so the strings are regarded as oriented. And so we distinguish a positive winding number from a negative winding number. Now, uh, the, the complete solution of the uh, wave equation uh, involves various terms. And so there, there's a, a center of mass, if you will, position. And then there can be terms linear in tau or linear in sigma. And so the conventional normalization involves this parameter called alpha prime, which is the so-called Rege slope parameter. Let me just remind you that about alpha prime, that it's related to the string tension by 1 over 2 pi alpha prime is the string tension. And, uh, and also, alpha prime has, when h bar and c are 1, uh, alpha prime has dimensions of length squared. And uh, so sometimes one uh, says that alpha prime is the square of the string length scale. So one would write that uh, alpha prime is L string squared. So that's the fundamental length scale that's introduced in string theory. So, that's, so this is a term that's a linear in tau. And then we can have a term that's linear in sigma as well. And that's determined simply by the requirement that we have winding number uh, w. So that's uh, plus 2r uh, uh, w sigma. So when I increase sigma by pi, that's 2 pi r w as it's supposed to be. And then, and then we have all the Fourier analysis on the sigma circle. And so there are a whole lot of terms involving Fourier series, uh, which I won't write down. I just represent them by dots here because they're not relevant to the discussion I want to make at the moment. But I just want to remind you that these Fourier series terms have coefficients uh, that are often denoted alpha n, and that when you quantize the theory, uh, that these uh, coefficients speak, have a harmonic oscillator-like commutation relations. Uh, that given by expressions of this sort. I'm not going to be using that. That's just to remind you of what the coefficients look like in the uh, Fourier series terms indicated by the dots. So, so that's what uh, the coordinate on a circle looks like. Now, the, now there's a basic fact about the two-dimensional wave equation that you all know, and that's that the general solution is easy to write down. Uh, it's a sum of two arbitrary functions of one variable, which are often referred to in this context as left movers and right movers. So there's a function of sigma plus tau, and there's another function of uh, sigma minus tau. Or maybe I want to write tau minus sigma. It doesn't really matter. Let me write tau minus sigma. So, so these describe excitations that move in one direction along the string, and these describe excitations that move in the other direction. So they're called left movers and right movers, and that's the general solution. Now, it's easy to take these terms linear and tau and sigma and to recast them as terms linear and tau plus sigma and tau minus sigma. And uh, if you do that, uh, what you get is that the coefficient of the uh, tau minus sigma term. So, so x right, for instance, uh, will we'll have a constant term, this x0. So I'll put half of x0 and x right and half of it in x left. That's a convention. And I've also introduced an object 
x0 tilde, which is completely extraneous because it doesn't contribute to x, but I can write it uh, when I write x left and x right separately in this way. So that case, takes care of this term. And now I have my terms proportional to tau minus sigma and tau plus sigma. And so, uh, well, there are various ways of writing it. And the, uh, the, the one interesting thing is that if you look at these expressions uh, for these coefficients, these square root of two alpha prime alpha zero things, so for example, this is equal uh, to uh, alpha prime k over r minus w r, and the other one, this one, is the same thing with a plus sign. So, so the WR is the winding number I already described. And the thing I failed to point out, but you surely know, is that this momentum P of the string is quantized on a circle. The, the requirement is very simple. It's that E to the I P X should be periodic. I mean, it should be single valued on the circle. And since X is identified with X plus two pi R, that means that the momentum P uh, has to be an integer multiple of 1 over r. So that introduces a quantity k, which is also an integer. So k is an integer, as is w. So the winding number and the kaluza klein excitation number, as it's called, are integers, and they appear in these two expressions. And then the key to understanding t-duality is to recognize the fact that these two formulas are very similar. And uh, specifically what that means is that if one do, does two things, namely you interchange the, the kaluza klein excitation number with the winding number, and simultaneously uh, what you do is you replace the radius r by r tilde, which is equal to alpha prime divided by r, if you do those two things at the same time, then uh, you can see that the equations are invariant. Or more, uh, so, uh, well, not quite. Uh, so, so what's the precise statement? If you do that, then x right gets a minus sign and uh, x left doesn't. So th these, correspond to x right going to minus x right and x left unchanged. So when you make these two interchanges. Uh, now, had I written down the spectrum of masses of the string excitations, they would be completely invariant. So, the sp so even though there's this minus sign in x right, the spectrum is invariant. And in fact, this is a symmetry of the theory. And one is actually describing the same theory when one uh, goes to this dual interpretation. So, uh, the, so the, so these compactifications can be associated with two-dimensional conformal field theories associated with the world sheet theory. And the, world, and the conformal field theory that describes compactification on a circle of radius r is the same conformal field theory as describes compactification on a circle of radius r tilde. So this is the famous r to 1 over r uh, t-duality uh, that one has, in this case, in the bosonic string. Uh, just to sketch very quickly uh, from the world sheet point of view, well, there's a simple argument uh, from the world sheet theory uh, viewpoint that uh, I'll just be very sketchy about this to save time. Uh, that if one writes, so, so the, the, wor the world sheet theory basically for a coordinate looks 
just like this. And uh, uh, if, if one writes this maybe with a half or so, and if one writes this with an auxiliary field and writes a V alpha grad X minus a half V squared, D2 sigma, uh, so th this is, describes the same theory because the equation of motion for V tells you that V is the gradient of X and if you substitute that back, you get this. I may have a minus sign wrong. Uh, so that's on the one hand, uh, but on the, uh, the alternative way of uh, studying this theory is to first look at the equation of motion for X and the equation of motion for X tells you that the divergence of V is zero. And that can be solved by saying that V is an epsilon symbol times a gradient of something else, X tilde. And so if you solve this equation in this way, that takes care of this term, and then you substitute this back in for this V here, then you get an expression that looks just like this, but with X replaced by X tilde. And so, uh, so in this way, one sees that the conformal field theory based on X is the same as the conformal field theory based on X tilde. And one also learns, just by comparing the equations, that on the, remember the, in the first way of analyzing this, when we solve for V, we got that the V was gradient of alpha, so, so it was gradient of X, rather. So, so we learn at the same time that the gradient of X is related to the dual of the gradient of X tilde in this sense, the two-dimensional dual. And this, when written out in components where you introduce, say, sigma plus tau and sigma minus tau, is exactly the statement that X left is equal to X left tilde and X right is minus X right tilde. So, uh, so interchanging, the, so changing the sign of just the right mover relative to the left mover uh, corresponds uh, to t-duality and does not change the conformal field theory. So that's the basic idea of t-duality for closed strings. Now the relevance of this to d-brains comes up when you consider uh, extending this discussion to consider open strings. Yes, yeah, so I emphasized in my discussion the, the zero modes here, but this conformal field theory argument here includes all the oscillator excitations and shows that in fact it's the entire right mover that flips on, not just the zero modes. How can you prove it by what? When I, when I do a mode expansion. In terms of the mode expansion. Yes, yeah, so, so from just looking at the spectrum alone, it isn't obvious whether or not the oscillator modes have to, to have this sign flip. But this conformal field theory argument makes it clear that that's required. OK, so now let me turn to uh, open strings. Can people see the sideboards, or should I just use the middle one? Is it OK? All right. I, so so in, the, in the case of an open string, say, in 26-dimensional space-time for, uh, for the uh, bosonic string, all, and again, we could be referring to this, coordinate, this one component of x that uh, us is on the circle, but this formula would apply in any case. There is no notion of winding for open strings, so we don't have the term linear and sigma here to start with. So we just have this p tau, the two alpha prime I've set equal to one, and then the, then there and then there are the oscillator terms. And 
The, the only thing that's important here is the cosine n sigma. Uh, so this is the standard expression for the open string mode expansion. And the important fact about it is that the sigma derivative vanishes at the ends of the string. So it's sigma equal to 0 or pi x prime is 0. And th this, these are Neumann boundary conditions. So that's the fact I want to remind you of about open strings. So that, this, so that would be an open string, say, in 26-dimensional space-time for the case of the bosonic string theory. Now, the uh, t-duality is going to act on open strings the same way it does on closed strings for a very simple reason, and that is that the world sheet theory is the same. The only thing that's different about the world sheet theory in the case of the open string are the boundary conditions. But, the, but aside from the endpoints, it's the same action. And so by the same argument, one again argues that the effect of a t-duality is that you can go to this dual picture where you have radius r tilde rather than r, and the thing that's different, all you have to do is to change the sign of the right moving piece of x to see what the t-dual description is. So the cosine can be written as a sum of a couple of exponentials, and one of those exponentials describes the left moving modes, and the other term describes the right moving modes. And so one just has to flip the sign of the right movers to see what the dual expression is. So if this thing is x left plus x right, then x tilde, which is x left minus x right, uh, has, a, has a mode expansion you can immediately read off. And it's x tilde plus p sigma. So this p now becomes the coefficient of sigma. And then we have, uh, again, this series uh, with a very similar kind of expression. But now it's with sines rather than cosines. And so, so this has the consequence that, x, that the values of x tilde are, 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 are fixed constants. So, for example, at sigma equals 0, x tilde is little x tilde at, at sigma equals 0. And the position at sigma equal to pi is also some definite fixed value. So these, these are Dirichlet boundary conditions. So the important fact in the case of open strings is that a t-duality transformation interchanges Neumann boundary conditions with Dirichlet boundary conditions. Now, in the old days of string theory, we wouldn't have considered uh, Dirichlet boundary conditions for a very simple reason, and that is it seemed like nonsense. We wanted the theory to have 26-dimensional Lorentz invariants, and to say that the end of the string should be at some particular p place seemed crazy because that was in manifest contradiction with Lorentz invariants. So therefore, we only considered ne Neumann boundary conditions. The modern viewpoint, and the correct viewpoint, is that it's a perfectly fine thing. In fact, it's required by this argumentation I've just given you that, that, that you should allow the possibility of Dirichlet boundary conditions, because in fact, it's even equivalent to Neumann boundary conditions through this t-duality, at least when you have a compactification on a circle. And, uh, and the reason it makes sense and is not in gross violation with Lorentz invariance is because the reason it's vanishing or, or has a fixed value is because there's a physical object on which it's ending. So the string is attached to a physical object, and that's the d-brain. So just making a string end at some specific point in spacetime would be kind of a kooky thing to do unless there was some physical object that was ending on, and that's in fact the case. So, so of course Lorentz invariance is broken, and it's broken because there's an object there, which carries energy density. It's some higher dimensional analog of a string. So, so that's the way Polchinski and collaborators First, we led to the notion of a D-brain. Okay. 
Yeah. D brains have become extremely important in the study of string theory for many reasons. And one reason is that you can not only have one D brain, but you can have a whole bunch of them. And, uh, and if, you, if you have n coincident D brains, say just as hyperplanes, in so, so how, what it, well, how big is this D brain? So when we just took a circle and we went to the dual description, what we had is that the position was localized on the dual circle. So that means that this D brain in that particular construction is filling all of the space time, but it's localized in one on this, in the circular direction. So, so that D brain, uh, be, since it's filling 24 spatial dimensions, would be called a D24 brain. So quite generally, the number of spatial dimensions that the thing has is, is, the, is the P in the DP brain. So the DP brain, so my example was a D24 brain. Had I compactified on an N torus rather than a circle and done T duality transformations on all N of those circular directions, then I would have gotten a D25 minus N brain. So, we could have, you can go, so, you can, so, in, so in the bosonic string theory, you can get D brains of any dimension in that way. So in any case, so these things are, are then thought of as kind of uh, as, as hyperplanes of infinite extent uh, in, embedded in the 26 dimensional space time. And if you have n of them that are coincident, uh, what happens is that you get a, 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 a gauge theory that lives on the world volume. And so the importance, one of the reasons D brains are important is because their world volumes carry non-abelian gauge theory. And non-abelian gauge theory is, of course, one of the ingredients you need to make contact with the real world. So, so this is uh, therefore potentially important. Uh, so the picture is very simple. Uh, so Although I want my brains to be coincident, I'll draw them separated just for ease of illustration. So here, th here are three would-be coincident D brains pulled apart a little bit for, illustri for illustrative purposes. And the point is that you have open strings uh, that start on one D brain and end on another. So for example, here, here, here's an open string going from this D brain to this one. And altogether, there would be nine such connections because uh, the strings are oriented. So you, have three choices for the starting point and three starting choices for the ending point. So you would have nine open strings, or n squared more generally, uh, open strings. And each of these strings can be quantized, and, and the zero modes include states that are, are, are gauge fields, uh, vector, vector bosons. And uh, so, you get, so you get n squared of vector bosons uh, as the, as as the, in the zero mode spectrum. Uh, so the reason it's important these things are coincident because when you pull them apart, they're not massless anymore. Uh, you're, you're, you're sort of doing a Higgsing uh, when you pull them apart and giving mass to the vector fields. But when the, when the brains are coincident, uh, then these vector bosons are massless. And, and, and so in this example, uh, you would get a U and gauge theory living on the world volume of the coincident. D brains. There are many generalizations of this story, of course. Uh, if one were dealing with strings that are unoriented, uh, which can happen in certain contexts that I'll describe later, uh, then, the, then, the, then you wouldn't get a UN group, but rather, depending on the situation, you would get either an orthogonal group or a symplectic. So D brains. So in thinking, so there are many ways of thinking about D brains, and one of the ways is to think in terms of the world volume theory, uh, which is the D brain analog of talking about strings in terms of the world sheet action of the strings. So so D brains have world volume actions, and uh, by studying those world volume actions, one can learn something about the string theory uh, that gives rise to them.
Yeah, there's, there's an important detail that I didn't mention yet, which should be mentioned. And that is, uh, when you do this compactification on the circle, or on multiple circles, uh, the compactified theory will contain U1 gauge fields. Not, not these gauge fields, but some other gauge fields. Specifically, in, in say, for example, in 26 dimensions, there's a metric tensor because the closed string spectrum includes gravity. And uh, so this is the gravitational field, if you will, uh, uh, for the uh, theory, say, in 26 dimensions. But when we uh, compactify on a circle, then, uh, then this thing can be thought of as a block diagonal form where one would have a, uh, uh, say, a 25 by 25 metric, which describes gravity in the compactified space. But then one has some scalar field over here and some vector field over here. So as the mu 25 components uh, would be a U1 uh, gauge field. So, so this compactification from 26 dimensions to 25 gives a U1 gauge field. And the reason I'm emphasizing that fact now is that the story with the t-duality uh, can be generalized to a situation in which these U1 gauge fields play an interesting role. So what is the idea? It's, it's kind of an analog of the Aharonov-Bohm effect in which you can have, uh, in, in the Aharonov-Bohm effect, you have some configuration which is topologically non-trivial in which you have vanishing field strength for a Maxwell field, uh, but, uh, but it has physical effects anyway. And the reason, the way that can work is basically uh, when, when the gauge field integrated around a circle uh, is not zero, uh, that, that, that's called a Wilson line. And uh, more generally, what one would write is something like e to the i uh, exponential a. This is called a Wilson line. So this is some element of the gauge group. And uh, so if this were non-abelian, you'd have to do some path ordering and stuff. But if it's abelian, there's no problem. And uh, so you can just take A to be a constant. So if you take A to be a constant and it's a Boolean field, then the field strength is 0. And so, uh, so this is, can be very simple. And, uh, and the, this has some consequences. Specifically, uh, when you do the canonical quantization, the canonical momentum, let me denote it by capital P, is the ordinary momentum minus E times this gauge field. So, so this gives you a shift in the gauge field. And this is the uh, thing that, f when you're on a circle, has to be a Klutz-Klein excitation number, an integer, divided by the radius of the circle. So this has the consequence that the momentum uh, now d is not just k over r, but it can differ by k over r by a, by a constant amount. And one can get what might be called a fractional Kaluza-Klein excitation number. So, the, uh, so this, this gauge field A can be re-expressed as an angle. And so one can write it as uh, theta over 2 pi r. So if one writes it as theta over 2 pi r, uh, so theta is then an angular uh, variable. And, the, uh, and what one is finding is that the ordinary momentum then uh, is, is no longer just uh, k over r. Uh, but if I, if I set this charge e to be 1, it is just differs by, some, by this theta parameter over 2 pi r. 
So depending on the value of this Wolfson line, you get this fractional momentum piece in the quantization condition. So that may seem a little mysterious and confusing, but it all becomes clear when you ask what happens in the t-dual picture. So now, we, so we take this situation and we go to the t-dual picture. And in the t-dual picture, what's happening is that our winding number uh, is now fractional. And so, we, uh, I could, right. So our winding number is now fractional. And so, so we can write that as, um, let me just get my notation straight here. Well, anyway, it's shifted by theta. So our, so our winding number is w plus some angular amount theta, basically, over 2 pi, say. And so what is the picture? So remember that in the dual circle, we were getting the, uh, the D-brain was localized on the dual circle. So this is the dual circle of radius R tilde. And now, when we have this fractional winding number, what we have really are two D-brains. And, uh, and, the and an open string uh, can start, in the, yeah, in the case of the open string, it can end on one, it can attach from one to the other. And so what the Wilson line is doing is keeping track of the positions of the, uh, of the D brains on the dual circle. So the Wilson lines map into the positions of the D-brains in the dual circle. If that wasn't completely clear, we can fix the details later, but that's the idea. So, so I want to now turn to superstrings. This has been bosonic strings, and bosonic strings are boring after all. Uh, in particular, in the case of the bosonic string, these D-brains are unstable. They decay. But in the case of superstrings, uh, the D-brains, uh, some of them at least, are stable. And the reason they are stable is that, uh, so in superstrings, some, some D-brains are stable. Some D-brains are stable. And the reason they are stable is that they, uh, that they carry a conserved charge. And to understand what it means for a D-brain or any kind of brain to carry a conserved charge, uh, one needs a lightning reminder of why an electrically charged particle carries a conserved charge and how that might generalize. So in the case of an electrically charged particle, you have a U1 gauge field, A, so A can be written as a one form. That's very convenient. So this is the vector potential in Maxwell theory. And I'll write a sub one to remind myself that it's a one form. And then there's a Maxwell field strength, which in the differential form language can be written as the exterior derivative of this one form. And that's a two form. And uh, so, that, so that's uh, the field strength in Maxwell theory. And then when you have a charged particle, it couples uh, in this way. 
So if it has charge E, then there's an interaction term in the action for the point particle, which can be written simply this way. And this describes the coupling of a charged particle to the U1 gauge field. And that charged particle is a stable object because it carries that conserved charge. And now all that generalizes very nicely uh, to all sorts of objects, including, D, including many D brains in superstring theory. So let me remind you how that works. So all one has to do is to generalize the notion of a Maxwell field. So we can have an n-form potential, which is 1 over n factorial a mu 1 up to mu n dx mu 1 wedge blah, 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 dx mu n. That's an n-form potential, which generalizes a Maxwell field. It's a totally anti-symmetric tensor. And out of this totally anti-symmetric tensor, one can define a field strength uh, as the exterior derivative. And it has the usual kind of gauge invariance, namely, you can make a gauge transformation by the exterior derivative of an n minus 1 form. And that leaves the field strength invariant. It's a gauge transformation. So the question is, what kind of object carries the associated charge? So we want is an analog of this formula. So we're going to have some kind of charge, which we'll call mu sub p. And we'll integrate this a So this is coupling to the, so this is an n-dimensional integral. So we want an object whose world volume has n dimensions. And with p-brains, it's conventional to describe the number of spatial dimensions and call it p. So n here is p plus 1. Uh, so let me just erase the n and write p plus 1. So this is the coupling to a p-brain. So we get back to the usual situation here for a zero brain. A, point, a charged point particle is a zero brain. And so this is the charge coupling of a brain to a generalized gauge field. And this kind of phenomenon shows up all over string theory and M theory. It's very fundamental. And and when, when, you, when you have brains that have these kinds of couplings, uh, then they are conserved by charge conservation, you know, just like the charged particle. So, so we could make a list of when does this happen. Well, and, and it already happens in, for oriented bosonic strings. In the case of the orion, oriented bosonic string, there's a two-form already present in 10 dimensions, so that would be usually called B, so that would be an example of an A2. And so, this, so you would have this kind of coupling for this B field for the, for the fundamental string. So this, this, this couples to the fundamental string. Uh, and that's true in the bosonic string theory. It's also true in the type 2 superstring theories. So type 2 superstring theories, type 2A and type 2B, also have these two-form uh, fields uh, that couple to the fundamental string. And so the fundamental string carries a conserved charge. And that means that this fundamental string is conserved. It, it that doesn't decay. It can, of course, if it's an excited state, it can decay to the ground state, but it doesn't you know, break apart. This is to be contrasted with a type 1 superstring, which does break. In the case of a type 1 superstring, this B field is not present. Uh, and so the, uh, so the type 1 string does not have this conservation property. Now, in the, in the case of the type 2 superstring theories, there are a whole bunch of other such 
fields. Uh, so in the case of the type 2A, in addition to the B mu nu, uh, one has what are called Ramon-Ramon fields. And there's a one form. Usually, do not, so instead of using the letter A, I'll use the letter C, but it's the same, same idea. And C just reminds me that it's Ramon Ramon. So there's a one form, so a vector potential. And there's a three form. And if you want to be redundant, you can define dual gauge fields, which would, be a, uh, which would give you a five form as well. So the, the five form is actually a dual to the uh, three form, and you could define a seven form, which was dual to the one form, but th that's redundant, so I'll put them in parentheses. So, so these, these things will have this kind of electric coupling uh, to, uh, so in this case, to a point particle, because right, a, a one form couples, so remember this index is one more than P, so P in this case is zero, so that means we get, so this field couples to an object called a D0 brain, this thing couples to a D2 brain, and these dual fields would have electric couplings to a, a four brain and a six brain. So in the type 2 A superstring theory, you have brains of, D brains of these various dimensions that carry conserved Ramon Ramon charges and uh, have these kind of couplings. In the case of the type 2B, it's a very similar story. We have Ramon Ramon fields in this case, C0, C2, C4. And then the, if, you do this if you do this duality, you can again give these redundant things, uh, which would be a C6 and a C8. And this, now if you just follow my rule, a zero form Ramon Ramon field should couple to a minus one brain, right? Because P is minus one, right? <laughs> so what does that mean? Well, the minus one brain actually is something, because you remember the way we count the dimensions, we only count the number of spatial dimensions. And so how can you have a negative spatial dimension? Well, if you Euclideanize the theory, the world sheet theory, so the time becomes space. Then, then that just cancels off the time dimension and you have a point in space-time. And so, this, so the thing that this couples to is actually what's called a D instanton, which plays an interesting role in type 2B string theory. So, so even though it sounds crazy at first, it, it's it, it plays an interesting role in studying the non-perturbative physics of the type 2B theory. More conventional is the C2, uh, which couples to a D string or a one brain, C4, which couples to a D3 brain, and then these things would have, D cup of, of, have uh, electric couplings to a D5 brain and a D7 brain. Uh, so the general rule you see is that in the type 2A theory, you have stable D brains for all even dimensions, and the type 2B theory, you have stable D brains for all the uh, odd dimensions. There's another important fact about Maxwell theory, which is that uh, that you can also have ma you can also have magnetic couplings. So, um, well, I talked about the dual fields here. So how, how is a field related to a dual field? Well, if, if we have a, uh, a field F P plus 1, or P plus 2 was my counting, wasn't it? Uh, so, yeah, so because for a zero brain, we had F2. So it's F P plus 2. Uh, then we can define a, a, a dual field strength. So this would be dual to a form 
in dimension d minus p minus 2, where d is the space-time dimension, so that's just the Hodge dual. And then if you write that thing, if you write, if you write this dual field, so let me write it, okay. So this is the dual of some new thing, let me call it F tilde. And this F tilde uh, can then uh, be written as the D of some other, of the dual vector potential. Uh, so that's what I was referring to when I wrote these C5 and C7 in parentheses. These were the dual gauge fields given by this uh, type of construction. And to say that these things couple electrically, which means uh, by this kind of a formula, is equivalent to saying that the dual gauge, the, that the original gauge field couples magnetically, has a magnetic coupling. So, so, the, uh, so in the case of the type 2A theory, uh, this means, for example, that the six brain is the magnetic dual of the zero brain, and the four brain is the magnetic dual of the two brain. And similarly, in the 2B, the five brain would be the magnetic dual of the one brain, and the D3 brain is self-dual, which is a very interesting fact. Uh, and that reflects the fact that the, that the uh, five-form field strength, which is given as DC4 in the type 2B theory, is required to be self-dual. So it's equal to the, it's dual. And because this five-form field strength in the type 2B theory is required to be self-dual, it follows that the D-brain, the couples to, has this kind of self-dual charge. So you can't say it's electric or magnetic. It, they're, they're equated to one another. There's also a very nice generalization of the uh, Dirac quantization condition relating electric and magnetic charge. Uh, so when you, when you couple a Maxwell field magnetically to a magnetically charged object, the magnetic charge, that's called a G, times, times an electric charge, E, is required uh, to be uh, 2 pi times an integer. That's the famous Dirac quantization condition. And that generalizes to these uh, uh, brains and their magnetic duals in a straightforward way. Somebody? I didn't understand what I'm supposed to explain. Oh, why it's self-dual. So that's just an esoteric fact about the spectrum of the type 2B superstring, which I haven't explained. But I could explain it. Uh, so since you asked, why don't I do that? So, so let me give you the quick way of understanding the massless spectrum of type 2 superstrings. So the massless spectrum of open superstrings simply consists of a gauge field and a Majorana vial spinner. Well, so lambda is Majorana and vial. So this is in 10 dimensions. And this is what would be the super Maxwell multiplet. And then the non-Bielian generalization would be called super Yang Mills. Ah, uh, but we'll just focus on Maxwell. So this A is in 10 dimensions. It has eight transverse polarizations. Uh, this lambda is a 32-component spinner, but it has Majorana and Vial conditions and satisfies the Dirac equation. And because of all that, it describes eight propagating degrees as freedom as well. So this is eight bosons and eight fermions. Now, one way of understanding ah. Uh, the massless spectrum of type 2 superstrings is to take this multiplet and to tensor and introduce it once for uh, left movers and to tensor that with the same thing for right movers. So, so with the left movers and the right movers, let me just put primes just to distinguish, but it's the same kind of multiplets. So you have a tensor, this is just group theory. So you have the, this kind of multiplet uh, tensored with this kind of multiplet. And there are two possible ways of doing this uh, because uh, the, these lambdas satisfying a vial condition 
uh, means that they're eigenstates of, uh, of the Dirac matrix that you could call gamma 11. So, so, so a positive chirality would be this, and negative chirality would have a minus sign here. And so the, so the two different cases are whether lambda and lambda prime have the same chirality or the opposite chirality. And if you do this tensoring with the same chirality for both of them, you get the massless spectrum of the type 2b superstring. And if you do this tensoring for the case where the two lambdas have the opposite chirality, then you get the massless spectrum of the uh, type 2a superstring. So the, way, the, way, the place where you find the, the gauge fields uh, are in the uh, tensoring of the two lambdas. So you're so you have what are, in a sense, bifermions, right? the fermion, but that's a boson, you see. So the Ramon-Ramon fields are, in this sense, bifermions, or bispinners, if you wish. Uh, and these bispinners can be decomposed into irreducible representations, which correspond to these various Cs here or here. And, uh, and in each case, there have to be 64 physical polarization states, 8 times 8. And, uh, and that's what you have in each case. And in this case here, the counting requires the self-duality condition, which can be consistently imposed in 10 dimensions in, when you have the Lorentzian signature. Did that answer your question? Okay. So the... Uh, generalization of this EG is 2 pi Z is that this mu P, so for in 10 dimensions, we would have that mu P times mu 6 minus P, because that's the 6 minus, if we have a DP brain, then the magnetic dual is a 6 minus P brain, and the product of their charges has to be 2 pi times an integer. So that would be the Dirac quantization condition for D brains. And the basic D brains always satisfy this in such a way that the product is just 2 pi. The, the integer is 1. And so to get bigger integers than 1, you need multiple D brains. So the basic D brains give you the minimum, minimal quantum uh, that, that's allowed by the Dirac quantization condition. See, I have half an hour, is that right? Okay. So, so let's say some more about T-duality. The T-duality can also be looked at from the point of view of the uh, effective action in space-time rather than the world volume. So I talked about the two-dimensional string world sheet action, uh, but I could have looked instead as at the space-time action. And so, so in the case of the superstring, we would have some 10-dimensional Lagrangian, which would be uh, say, the, and contain the massless fields of type 2a or type 2b, and uh, uh, would be some low energy approximation to the full string theory. And one can uh, show where the string coupling constant fits in as 1 over g string squared. It arises from the vacuum expectation value of the dilaton field, but let me just write it this way. So you can pull out the string interaction the string coupling constant as a factor out front. And so the point I wanted to make now is that when we do this compactification on a circle, we can effectively do one of these integrals. Uh, just assume that all the fields are independent of the circular dimension. So if you assume that all the fields are independent of the circular dimension, then this just becomes 2 pi r over g string squared times d9x. In the result of the Lagrangian in the remaining dimensions. So I just integrated a constant over a circle to get 2 pi r. So, so the reason I point this out is that if, if, if we have 
you say this is, well, if, this, if this were the type 2A string, an important fact I failed to point out so far is that 2T duality is going to take the type 2A string to the type 2B string. Uh, so let me, let me just assert that now, and I'll explain in a moment why it's true. So in the type, so t, so in T duality, uh, there will be there'll be some other coupling constant G tilde squared, and some other Lagrangian. But when we do this, the result we have to end back at the same place. So the Lagrangian has to be the same. But now we're so uh, but since the effective theories of since T duality requires that you end up with the same theory in nine dimensions by T duality. So the relation that I'm looking to derive here is between the coupling constants. So what we're going to argue from do it, we're going to do the integral here also. So we're going to deduce that 2 pi r uh, divided by g string squared should be equal to 2 pi r tilde divided by g string tilde squared. So this uh, T duality uh, reasoning uh, relates uh, the uh, couplings in this way. So remember R times R tilde is alpha prime. So, so when, you do, when you do this uh, story, you find this relation between the string coupling constants. Okay, so let me explain why 2A goes to 2B. There are several ways of thinking about this. Uh, remember, what we did was we just said that x right goes to minus x right on the, on the, further in the, on the circle that we're doing the t duality. That was our basic rule for t duality. Now, if if we describe superstrings in the RNS, so-called RNS formalism, then associated to every x, there's a world sheet spinner. So if this was, say, x9, right, which is the circular direction in the case of the type 2 superstring, then there would be a, a, a world sheet Fermi field, psi 9, and there, it also has left movers and right movers, and the rule is that the right, again, the right movers will flip sign and the left movers won't. And again, this can be understood as a symmetry, symmetry of the conformal field theory. Uh, in other words, you can do the same kind of uh, manipulation on the world sheet action that I sh showed you for deriving this, to derive the corresponding thing for the world sheet Fermi field. So under a T duality, not only does the X coordinate flip sign, but this a world sheet spinner flips sign as well. Now, in the uh, Ramond sector, which is relevant for understanding fermions, uh, the psi has a, has a, has a, again, has a Fourier expansion like the X does, and the zero mode of psi is essentially a Dirac matrix. So the psi mu has a zero mode, which is up to a, f f a constant of proportionality, so some constant, times, times our 10-dimensional Dirac matrix. The thing is 10-dimensional is mu, the matrix itself is 32 by 32, plus, plus Fourier series. Now, in defining the chirality of spinners, we had this object gamma 11, which is the product of all these gamma matrices. And, and so, remember that, uh, that whether a spinner had positive or negative chirality was relevant for understanding whether we had the uh, type 2A or type 2B theory. So when we flip the sign of psi 9, that means we're flipping the sign of gamma 9 in particular. And flipping the sign of gamma 9 means we're flipping the sign of gamma 11 because everything else is a untouched. And therefore, we're interchanging left positive chirality with negative chirality. So this interchange of positive and negative chirality accompanies uh, this T duality, and, and that's what takes the type 2A into the type 2B, and vice versa. 
This fact can be confirmed by thinking about the D-brains. So remember that when we did a T-duality transformation, the D-brain got localized in the dual circle. So So, so I, I guess I didn't emphasize this fact before, so let, let me, so let me back up and say something which was implicit in my previous discussion but needs to be made explicit. And that is under a T-duality, interchange is what you could call a wrapped D-brain with an unwrapped D-brain. What I, what I discussed was that if I started with open strings and ended n duality transformations on an n torus, that in the case of the bosonic string, I got a d25 minus n brain. But what if I had done no t duality transformations at all? That's n equals zero. I would have had a d25 brain. So the, the point is that the reason that you, that you have open strings in the bosonic string theory in the first place before you do any t-dualities is because there are d-brains there already that are filling the space-time. And so, so the existence of open strings and the existence of d-brains go hand in hand. And so when I did the t-duality, I said I got a, on the dual circle, I had a d-brain which was localized, which I identified as a d24 brain. But the more, the more general story is that on the, so this is the circle of radius r tilde, that on the original circle, the d-brain was wrapping the circle. And on the dual circle, it was localized. So the general rule is that if you have a brain, a d-brain that wraps a circle and you do a t-duality transformation that on, a, on that circle, then, uh, then it becomes localized in the dual. So localized. So wrapped, unwrapped means localized or, or, or wrapping. Wrapped, unwrapped means localized. Excuse me? Yes. Uh, well, it actually it can be localized, and what I was trying to explain before was when you introduced the Wilson line, that the Wilson line controls where it's localized in the dual circle. So, so it, there's some arbitrary position that you could call a zero, which is when you have no Wilson line, but what you call no Wilson line is somewhat arbitrary also. So the arbitrariness is a uh, match, and you can consider things that are smeared also, but that would confuse this discussion. So, so I don't want to do that. So I want to emphasize the idea that a wrapped D-brain go, goes under T-duality to an unwrapped one. And, and so, so this meshes very nicely with my claim that the type 2A and type 2B uh, are interchanged by T-duality because you remember that the stable D-brains in the type 2B theory had p odd, and the stable d brains in the type 2a theory had p even. And so that meshes very well with the idea that what was uh, wrapping in, in one side gets localized in the other. So an even dimensional object will go into an odd dimensional object under this kind of a transformation. Of course, if, if, you, if you do a t-torus, if you have a two-torus and dualize both directions, then 2a would go to 2a, 2b would go to 2b, et cetera. Okay. Now, in my remaining 15 minutes, so I'm just covering some of the highlights from chapter six in this wonderful book. Uh, 
I think I'll, okay. So maybe I'll just say a mention, I'll say something very briefly about type one superstring. So type one superstring has uh, open strings in 10 dimensions, unoriented open strings. So you have unoriented open and closed strings. Half as much supersymmetry as in the type two theories. And the fact that there are open strings, we, we learned from our previous discussion, means that this theory has space-time filling D-brains. So this theory has space-time filling D9-brains. Well, how many of them are there? Well, there are different ways of addressing that question. But remember, I told you that when you have coincident D-brains, you get, a, you get a, a gauge theory. And that uh, you get a UN gauge theory if they're oriented open strings, and you get a SON or SPN if they're unoriented open strings. Well, in this case, one knows from anomaly analysis, which was discussed in an earlier chapter, which I won't review, that the choice of the gauge group that it gives consistency is an SO32 gauge group. This is a rank 16 gauge group and corresponds to there being 16 coincident D9 brains. These D9 brains are necessarily coincident because they're space-time filling, so there's no way to pull them apart. Now, if this were the whole story, there'd be a problem, however. And that is that the, one of the crucial consistency conditions is that, is that this conserved charge has to be canceled uh, in, the, in this situation. And so there has to be another object that cancels this charge. And so the claim is that there is another object, which is called an O9 minus brain, or, or O9 minus plane, if you will, an orientifold plane. It carries D9 brain charge minus 16. It's just one of them, but its charge is minus 16, so that the total charge is zero. There also exist objects called O9 plus planes. They exist, can be defined, but they would have charge plus 16 and would not cancel this charge. So that's not what you, so this is the one that works. But I'll come back to that point. Now, where does this thing come from? And what does it do for you? Is it just a figment of our imagination? Well, it's not just a figment of our imagination because these D9 brains carry energy density. Ah, uh, there's a, these are BPS objects, which means that their energy density is related to their charge by supersymmetry. And so there's a definite amount of energy density that they carry. And yet, the vac this, this has a Lorentz invariant vacuum, and so the total energy density has to be zero. So the d energy density of the D9 brains has to be canceled by something, and it's canceled by the O9 plane, which has a negative energy density. It's kind of weird, but it, it's true. So, so you have this O9 plane with negative energy density. So the O9 minus plane, not only does it cancel off the energy density of the D9 brains, but also it carry, not only does it cancel off the charge, it also cancels off the energy density so that you're left with, with zero cosmological constant. Uh, now that's not the only possibility. If you wanted to use O9 plus plane, you could do it. If you use the O9 plus plane instead, you would still have to cancel off the charge. And the way to cancel off the charge if you have an O9 plus plane is to have 16 anti-D9 brains. So an anti-D9 brain 
has charge minus one rather than plus one. So if you add 16 of those, you can cancel the charge of an 09 plus plane. However, and, and then if you do that, uh, these things will turn out, will give you a gauge group instead of being SO32 is USP32, a symplectic group. So why don't you learn much about this theory? Uh, well, introducing the antibrains breaks the supersymmetry. So this is not supersymmetric and one doesn't have the same kind of mathematical control that one has for the usual type 1 theory. It's not supersymmetric. So this is kind of an esoteric curiosity. And even though it ha the, the energy density again cancels between the anti-9 brains and the O9 plus plane, so zero vacuum density, but that's only true in the tree of pro classical approximation, and there's no reason that quantum corrections should respect that. And so it's plausible, although not known, that an that a energy density would be generated by quantum corrections. Uh, whereas in the other case, they can't be because it's protected by supersymmetry. Uh, yeah. I'm not prepared to explain that right now, but, it, but, it, but it's true. Yes. Right. So, so the general rule. So suppose they weren't. Suppose we had a circle and they only filled eight, all the other dimensions and were localized on the circle. The general rule is the is that the charge on the compact space has to be canceled. Here it's kind of a degenerate case because the transverse compact space is zero dimensional. So it's a little hard to see in that sense. But, uh, but if you view it as a, as a generalization of that case where you have a compact space, then it's, then it's clear. Okay. So this was just a footnote here. Uh, the, the, these theories can be deduced from the type 2b superstring theory by a procedure known as orientifold projection. But I won't go through that. And it's also interesting to study the t-duality of the type 1 theory, which leads you to something called type 1 prime. But I also won't go through that. So what I want to do in my remaining 10 minutes is to say a little bit about the structure of the world volume theory of d-brains. Uh, So suppose we have a single D brain. So that so on the single D brain, uh, there's going to be a massless U1 gauge field. So we're going to have a Maxwell field. So we have a Maxwell field. So the field strength F mu nu. And so from the space-time point of view, say 10 dimensions, there'll, there'll be some kind of Lagrangian uh, which We'll describe the dependence on this field strength and the effective action in some approximation. And so what is the approximation I want to consider? The approximation I want to consider for this discussion now is I'm going to allow the field strength to be large. So I want to, so I'm not just looking for Maxwell theory. I'm looking for something more general where I'm allowing higher powers of F than appear in Maxwell theory, because I'm allowing F to be large. But to, but to have a mathematical control, we require that derivatives of F are small. So more precisely, if I multiply by the string length scale, that that's small compared to F. So, so we want, we're allowing large fields, but they have to be slowly varying in space and time. So if we, so if we keep all the large de F dependence on large fields, but slowly varying, then we're led to some nonlinear Lagrangian, uh, which was guessed not only before the discovery of string theory, but even before the discovery of quantum mechanics. 
And it was, and so the, the, the basic formula was guessed by Born and Infeld way back when. I don't remember the date. It was before, even before my time, if you can imagine that. And, uh, and so they wrote down a formula. They, they were, of course, thinking about four-dimensional space-time. And they wrote down a formula, so k is some constant. So eta is the Minkowski metric. F is the Maxwell field strength. K is a constant that's negotiable. They were interested in four dimensions. And they said this formula is a constant plus the Maxwell term, some other constant out here, uh, plus higher orders in F. And the reason they guessed this particular nonlinear generalization of Maxwell theory is that if you replace eta by a, by a metric, more, so a generalization would be this would be some kind of metric, uh, that then this would have general coordinate invariance. So, so they felt this fit nicely with general relativity. Uh, but th those rules don't lead uniquely to this formula. You can invent millions of other formulas that would have those properties as well. So it was kind of dumb luck that they hit on just this formula, because this is precisely the right formula for what comes out of, of D-brains in superstring theory in this approximation. And it's an interesting formula. I mean, it, it gets jazzed up by other stuff, but this basic structure uh, survives. I don't know if they, I was going to discuss that, but I don't know if they were, I don't know if they were aware of that or not. I, I always credit Antoniatis with that, <laughs> but maybe that's just my ignorance. Uh, and certainly another motivation that they d definitely did have was that they knew that the classical self-energy of a point charge is infinite. And they wondered by whether an, a, a nonlinear extension of Maxwell theory would cut off that infinity. And this has exactly that property. That, uh, that if you introduce a point charge, uh, that, the, the, that the classical energy associated with that is finite. So you see there's a scale here. It, it turns out after some, some analysis, we'll discuss that k has to be 2 pi alpha prime. And so the string length scale intru gets entered in this constant k. And that's the, cu that's the effective cutoff uh, the scale for that determines the classical self-energy of if you use this generalization of Maxwell theory. So to come to the point that uh, Herman was just making, uh, suppose we look at this formula in the general case, not just in four dimensions, but in n dimensions, and, and suppose we consider it now for two dimensions. So in two dimensions, replacing this back by eta, so in two dimensions, it's easy to do the determinant. And what you get is 1 minus k squared f0, 1 squared. So this is the two-dimensional case of this, because the matrix is just 2 by 2, so the determinant is easy. And, uh, and this, this shows the fact that the strength of the, f the field strength can't exceed 1 over k, basically. Uh, and so because the energy density goes to infinity as f goes to 1 over k. Now, if we go to a gauge where a0 is equal to 0, then this is just a, then f0 1 squared is just a1 dot squared. Now, if we imagine taking the spatial dimension to be a circle and doing a t-duality transformation, then we remember that the, that the value of this a field, which is, which is then identified as this Wilson line, gets identified as the position on the dual circle. So this becomes x dot squared with some coefficient, which is, involves 2 pi alpha prime. And so, so if I call that v squared, this thing, so let me, let me put the k squared here. So this thing, in, turn, in the dual picture, becomes the square root of 1 minus v squared integral just over the time, because I've compactified away the space. And, and there's a coefficient, which will be identified as the mass. 
And this is precisely the formula for the action of a, mass, of, of a massive point particle. And so this particular structure is related by T duality to exactly the structure uh, that's required by special relativity, by Lorentz invariance in the T dual picture. So, so what from other considerations would seem like a rather arbitrary formula is, is, is required for that reason. Now, another way of understanding this structure, which is much fancier, and I don't have time to go into, is to uh, take the, uh, the D brains in type 2 superstring theory and to write down an analog of the uh, string world sheet action in the GS formalism. So that's a formalism in which the world sheet coordinates include, in addition to x, uh, they include coordinates theta, so you're, uh, which are superspace coordinates. So you have uh, x, mu, and theta, some thetas. There are two of them, theta 1, theta 2. And, and then you have, your, and you have your gauge fields. And so you can write down a world volume action. Uh, so, so, this, so these things describe a mapping of the world volume into superspace. And so you, if you write down a world volume action in terms of these things, and you do things analogous to what's done for the GS, uh, form, in the GS formalism, uh, then you're required to introduce something called kappa symmetry, which is a local fermionic symmetry in the world volume. And if you impose all that and turn the crank, uh, you get lots and lots of terms involving all these things, but should that basic structure is embedded in there. So, and the details of that are explained also in this chapter. But I've reached 9.30, so even though there's more than... I, there is another topic I had hoped to discuss, but uh, namely the Myers effect. So, if there's time for discussion, then I encourage someone to ask me, what is the Myers effect? <laughs> okay.